All right, good afternoon. I'm Margaret Frondorf, Director of SIS Alumni Relations, and I'm here with Ira Kornbluff, who was with the class of 1963, and we're here on April 3rd, 2014. And Ira, I just tell me a little bit how you got to SIS. What was your pathway as you thought about a master's degree? Well, I was an undergraduate at the University of Wisconsin, and I was having a really fine time there. And so I couldn't take a break to do a junior year abroad. And so I was graduating with no junior year abroad, and I haven't been to Europe. So I went into this office in the administration building, and I was looking for uh, some sort of fellowship or some sort of school on the continent of Europe where they spoke English, because I only spoke English, and I didn't want to go to England. And lo and behold, there was this Bologna Center. And I just applied. And Dean Wilcox came traveling through the Middle West and we met and he, we got on extremely well and uh, off I went. To Bologna. Yeah. Talk a little bit about Bologna. Arriving there, first thoughts of your environment and well, the students. Well, was really extraordinary. Uh, it's different now, but there was an, uh, the school leased or owned an apartment building or half an apartment building. And these, uh, these were two bedroom apartments, and there were two of us students in each bedroom. Now, so I was in an apartment. Uh, there was me, who was sort of this very youngish Jewish fellow from New York, and in my room I was sharing it with a, uh, an older Frenchified Algerian, and the other bedroom was uh, some upper-class English guy whose father was a uh, brigadier general and he was sharing it with this German. Uh, and that was not a good mix, of course, then either. So it's pretty, pretty amazing that we all are there together and uh, you can't have a learning experience like that anyplace else. You just can't. And Favorite class? Something stand out? Oh yeah, no, there was, uh, it was as far as classes are concerned, what happened in Bologna is that the classes entailed much less work and you learned much more mm. than the classes in Washington. And for me specifically, there was Alfred Grosser, and he did contemporary Germany and he did contemporary France. And he was really quite brilliant. And then there was a class I guess I went to anyway, it was uh, contemporary Italy, uh, taught by this fellow who smoked a lot named Mancini. And uh, God! You just, you know, when you're dealing with geniuses standing up there talking, nothing competes with that. Absolutely nothing. The social environment uh, in Bologna before you headed back to Washington? What do you mean? Just um, maybe talking a little bit about um, some adventures in, in, in Italy uh, and or maybe the politics that you remember there uh, while you were a student? Well, it was a, you know, uh, there was a communist administration in the city. And I guess the main event of the fall was, uh, this was the fall of 62, it was the Cuban Missile Crisis. And uh, we had newspapers. We didn't have anything else really. And we used to get the New York Times at the corner of the, uh, uh, the you know, the main, the main corner down in, in where that cafe was. Anyway, you know what the main corner is yeah. in uh, Bologna. And uh, all the Europeans except the Germans were frightened to death and uh, the Germans were with us, you know, uh, moving to be very, very strong. But it blew over quickly, and, uh, but it was interesting to see how it divided. And the social life was, everybody was interested in everybody else. You could not be. Uh, there, were, there were some things that could never be today. Basically, the European contingent was all upper class, and uh, there were a couple of middle class Europeans and the upper class Europeans were not nice to them. Mm. They really were not nice. They mm. found them just completely unacceptable. With Americans, they didn't know who was who. And so it was easy for me. You know, they just couldn't figure it out. With some, they could. Some people are pretty obvious. But with most of it, you, you just don't know. And uh, so it was kind of uh, So back in Washington, walking through these, uh, new, in this new building here on Massachusetts Avenue, Right? That would... This is not new. I mean, I was in this building. I guess I was the first class in this building. Yeah. Like, yeah, I arrived here in the uh, fall of uh, 63, and I mm -hmm. graduated in 64. Mm -hmm. So the building seems the same. It really does seem the same. 
Uh, but remembering your experiences back in 1962, sort of in Washington. Any, uh, some thoughts about that? Uh, differences between sort of classmates uh, in Bologna and then back here in Washington? Well, what we did is we knew, some of us knew each other in Bologna, and some of the Europeans actually came over here too. And so uh, we were mostly, uh, I think we mostly stayed together. I mean, not exclusively together, we met other people and had a very nice time, and social life was okay. Uh, but uh, it, it carried over. It wasn't like going to a completely new place. So what did you do after graduation? After graduation, I went to uh, law school. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was... I guess I never became a lawyer then. Uh, and then uh, I went to the Foreign Service. And the Foreign Service was, uh, I was in there for three years. I had one okay job, and the other two were really very silly. And uh, then it went on. I had nine careers. And in the end, I, the law degree turned out to be handy, because I was sitting in a house in Southampton with nothing to do. And I thought, well, I have this law degree. It's all paid for. But I did the bar exam. And so I've been doing that for really uh, close to 30 years. It's my ninth career. How long were you in the Foreign Service? Three. Three years. A lot of people did three years then. Yeah. Because it was very Decided frustrating. it wasn't for you. Yeah, that was very frustrating. It really, a lot of things made no sense. I, I, you know, uh, the company wasn't good. Say I was at uh, the Consul General in Frankfurt, and uh, we lived in a garden apartment development that was owned by the uh, State Department. And so we were all there, the junior, junior officers. and. Uh, I think people from the GAO and people from the FAA, uh, but the other Foreign Service people, what they were really interested in was uh, uh, stereos, their stereos. And I remember they wouldn't let their wives touch their stereos. Stereos were really <laughs> treasured things, and they all, another thing they all really enjoyed doing was washing their cars. And uh, the more advanced people had tape recorders. And then they all said, you have to buy meat at this PX because there's no meat in Germany. And that was really not true. I mean, the meat at the PX was, the beef was three different shades of gray. And there was really fabulous food in Frankfurt if you just walked down into the town. Yeah. <laughs> so. So you were about getting out and about and meeting people and enjoying the culture and I experiencing tried. it. Yeah, I know. I like being there. You know. People said, well, everybody hates Frankfurt. I mean, don't you, do you really dislike Frankfurt? And I said, no, it's, uh, uh, you know, it may be the least charming of German cities, but all German cities are charming, so it's okay. And yeah. of course, it's when you're in Europe, it's very easy to travel. You just see a lot of things, and it's, uh, it's easy than fly, easier than flying across the Atlantic. So when you finished your stint in the Foreign Service, back to law then? Not right away, no. I had these other seven careers in between, I think. Can, name, can you name all seven? We have to do that in seven, seven seconds. <laughs> well, I was, uh, I, I was at the New York State Council on the Arts, a special assistant to the executive director, and then I did some arts fundraising. I did some political fundraising in Manhattan, and I did fundraising for radio, and I was in the international department of the Bankers Trust Company, which doesn't exist anymore mm. for good reason. And, uh, just what Neiman else? Marcus. Huh? Neiman Marcus. Oh, I had, a, I had a long Christmas job in Neiman Marcus. Amazing. Yes, that was nice. You need a lot of various things happening all at once to stay interested in a career. You're you're dynamic and uh, you get things quickly. It, it's very clear. Um, well, I think I think what's you know what I I always try to tell people to come to the school. Yeah. Uh, to Bologna particularly. It's Bologna that I already talked about, but when you're at Bologna, you might as well get, the, get a degree, you'd get a master's. So it's just a, it's a fantastic experience. It yeah. really moves you on into the world. So your advice to students today, um, what, would you, what would you say to them as they think about their careers and they're getting close to graduation? What advice would you give them for their careers? Well, I don't know, because they been in school and they have to look around and see what's available. I think what's really good about this particular degree and this particular kind of education is that it, there's a lot of flexibility and it's a very international kind of world now, much more than it was then. 
And so you, there are lots of directions you can go in. I mean, I've given advice to someone, say, uh, uh, I said, you should do this. And he said, oh, this guy said, no, I shouldn't do it. I should go to business school at Columbia. That's, that's my ticket to paradise. And uh, it wasn't his ticket to paradise. This is better. You know? The flexibility is very, very important, I think. But also in your career, having had nine of them, as you say, what's the thread driving you through these various pathways of nine careers that kept you going? There must be something. What was the motivator there? Well, life goes on. And you try and figure something out. You know, you have to usually have to have some sort of a job. I mean, I had, uh, at one point I did acquire a little bit of money, so when I sat for seven years being unemployed, I could manage that. Uh, but, you know, you don't waste that time. I remember. What I did was read uh, important German novels, because in seven years you can pick up German, and important German novels are a lot yeah. of fun. But really what came from this international kind of education is, is it's like any liberal arts education. Even if you're not doing anything specifically involving it, it it's part of your life. Mm -hmm. It makes for a much better life. Mm -hmm. So it's never you never say, why did I do that? Because I'm not using it. Because it's always there. And those, um, the values that you uphold, yeah, I know you have a, a successful daughter. Has uh, she, She's similar and has picked up the same sort of... Uh, well, I told her to go, too. But she didn't. She didn't go to graduate school at all. Uh, she basically is a, is a writer, and so she's wound up being an editor at a magazine in New York, an interior design magazine in New York. And uh, but you know, she, the fact of being my daughter, she's been exposed to a lot of international type of things, yeah. and she certainly traveled a lot. Yeah. And uh, you know, she spent some time in. Uh, Spent some time in France, spent some time in England, and uh, travels around. I mean, she has a French husband, and uh, they're always traveling. Usually somebody's calling up from Europe and saying, you know, they're getting an invitation to come to some wedding, and uh, they just get on the plane, they go, and uh, even it's just for a long weekend. So, uh, so it's, uh, well, it's all part of it. And it's just, the world is such a close place, and it's just so easy to do, and it's not a big deal. It's just part of the fabric Well, of I don't life. know. We all know it is a big deal in a way, because you ever try and uh, fly into uh, Frankfurt or fly into Charles de Gaulle. It's a very big deal. You really want to figure out how not to do that. Yeah. <laughs> Any last thoughts before we close uh, about SICE? And, uh, it's just a, it's a great education. Yeah. It's a great education. It really is suited to now. And even if you never really use it specifically, it's good for your life. Yeah. It's what they say about the humanities. It's good for your life. You always have that. That is a great quote. And thank you so much, Ira. Appreciate you being here and interviewing with us. And thank you again.